Today, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Jennifer Kaplan to speak on the topic of Funny You Don't Look Funny, the generations of Jewish humor from the silent generation to millennials. Dr. Kaplan is associated, Associate Professor and the Jewish Foundation Chair in Judaic Studies at the University of Cincinnati. As the child of an itinerant actor and circus clown, she grew up steeped in classical Jewish humor, developing a deep respect for comedy as an art form. As an academic, she became a scholar of American religion and popular culture, specializing in American Judaism. She works extensively with film, television, and multiple sites of pop culture engagement. Her book, Funny You Don't Look Funny, was released in 2023, uh, and it's received enthusiastic reviews. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Kaplan. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, yes, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this series um, and to everybody at Colette Maim um, and all of you for coming. When when Marilyn first emailed me and said that they were they were doing this series and the theme for the year was Lador Vador, I was like, oh yes, this I I want to be part of that. This is this is the conversation that I I'm having right now. So. Um, I'm very, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, as Marilyn said, uh, I will talk for um, 45 minutes and change. Um, and what I want to do is just talk a little bit about what was going on in the world um, and what has been going on in the world for the last several decades that caused me to want to tell the story that I wanted to tell in the book and, and why it took the shape that it did. And then I'd like to spend some time talking a little bit about what I found about, about these different generations of Jewish humorists. Um, I do have some, some clips queued up if we have time and the tech gods are in our favor. Um, ever since COVID, production companies have gotten very savvy about limiting what you can stream over platforms like Zoom. Um, so stuff that's freely available on YouTube is about the last bastion of what I can get. Um, so that, that limits, that limits our ability. Um, but, but we'll, we'll see if we can look at some examples of things as we go. Um, so to talk a little bit about the book and why it looks the way that it does and, and why I wanted to tell the story that I'm telling in it, um, this book came about as um, it came out of my dissertation research as um, first academic books usually do. If, if you are not familiar with academia, um, you know, we, we generally have to write something that is roughly the length of a book for our dissertation to get our PhD. And so then we turn that into our first book. Some people um, can just kind of change the formatting a little bit and publish it as is. Um, I didn't want to do that because the project that I had undertaken that became my dissertation ended up telling a different narrative than what I wanted um, the book to be. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and, and why. Um, so my, my PhD is in religious studies. Uh, so the project, as I initially worked on it, was very much focused on religion and it was structured around what you may have heard referred to as the three-legged stool of Judaism, which is Torah, God, and Israel. Um, and so I had sections in the book looking at humor about Torah and humor about God and humor about Israel, meaning collective Jews. Um, and, and so that, that did what it needed to do for the dissertation. But during the, the point at which I was just starting to write my dissertation in 2013, um, there were kind of a couple of things that happened online right at the same time, and I, I think actually related to each other, that stuck in the back of my mind and that pushed me a couple of years later when I had graduated and, and I began to think about what I wanted my book to look like to take the whole thing apart and put it back together in, in a different way. And so the first thing that happened is that in 2013, the Pew Foundation put out this massive study that they called the Portrait of American Jews. Um, if you are 
not familiar with the Pew Foundation, they are um, a, a sociological research nonprofit, basically here in the United States, who do just massive amounts of survey collection and data crunching to present different snapshots of communities and, and things around the world. And so during 2012, they had conducted one of the largest surveys of um, American Jews and they crunched all that data and, and they put it out in October of 2013. Um, so I wanna share my screen here a little bit um, so that you can see some of this and I apologize, it's small. Um, there, I can zoom in on it a little bit. So there are hundreds of pages of results in this survey. But as I was reading through it, I came across this bit. And the survey, the survey covers just absolutely everything about American life. Um, it's got a lot of information about um, denominational demographics and, you know, is the reform movement getting bigger or smaller? Is the conservative movement getting bigger or smaller? That kind of thing. And what is the current age of the Jewish population? You know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and in and amongst all of that, there was this question where they asked people to say, you know, blank is an essential part of what being Jewish means to me. And um, if you can't see the text, the, the number one response was remembering the Holocaust, that 73% of the respondents said that that was an essential part of being Jewish. And the very bottom one is eating traditional Jewish foods. Only 14% of the respondents said that that was essential to what being Jewish means to them. But in the middle, um, we had having a good sense of humor. That, that is one of the things that they asked people. And 42% of respondents said that having a good sense of humor was essential to what being Jewish meant to them. And if you're looking at it, it's statistically, it, it's basically an identical response rate to caring about Israel at 43%. Um, and is more than twice the number of people who responded that observing Jewish law is essential to what being Jewish means to them. So, so I'm I'm thinking about that, and I'm I'm sort of noodling around with that idea, and and, and that's that's setting off little little bells in my brain, and and that's that that's pushing me to say that there's there's something here, and that there's something I want to think about. Um, so then, about a week after the Pew survey came out there was an op-ed published in Haaretz that was this, um, beware the American cultural Jew. When being culturally Jewish in America means little more than locks and bagels and a vague duty to repair the world, Israel should also be worried. And this, as I say, this came out October 9th, the Pew survey hit on October 1st. So even though, you know, he starts out by saying that he's, he's talking about the Pew survey, um, he doesn't, he doesn't go into too much depth about what parts of the survey he's necessarily responding to, but this is, he, he is responding to that. Um, and this set off different kinds of, of bells in my brain. Um, because I am the precise right age to have been growing up in the 1980s and 1990s when this narrative about quote unquote cultural Judaism, and this is not a phrase that I like, this is not a phrase that I even think, like this is not a thing that I think exists, um, but, but the phrase has taken on a life of its own and, and unfortunately nobody asked me my opinion when they were developing it. Um, so <clears throat> in, in the 1970s, there was um, a study that came out that said that the Jewish intermarriage rate, at least in the diaspora, was over 50%. And everybody just freaked out. Um, Jewish organizations freaked out, synagogues freaked out, Jewish communal leaders freaked out. Um, in hindsight, it turns out that that data was flawed and, and the rate was, was most likely not 50% and has actually not 
ever been over 50%, but it is high. And, and that had been a really precipitous jump from where it was it, at the early part of the 20th century, it was in the single digits, you know, 10% or fewer of Jews married somebody who wasn't Jewish. By the mid century, it had jumped up to 20, between 20 and 30%. Um, so then this jump in the seventies, all the way up to approaching 50%, this was alarming for people. And, and this was, it was a big jump, even if it was actually 45% and not 50, it was still a big jump. And that number has stayed consistently in the forties um, for the last 40 years now. Um, so since, since that point, the Jewish intermarriage rate in the diaspora has stayed somewhere in the 40% range. And so that caused um, a great deal of concern and people were very certain that that meant the imminent demise of diaspora Judaism, that if 50% of Jews were marrying non-Jewish partners and some smaller percentage of that of intermarried households raised their children with Jewish identities. And they were speculating that children of intermarried households, even if they're raised with a Jewish identity are more likely to then be intermarried themselves. Um, that within two generations, this is going to spell the wholesale destruction of diaspora Judaism. And, and that people needed to find something to blame in all of this. What, what can we blame for the fact that this intermarriage rate is so high and that we are so terrified about, um, about what that means for the future of Judaism? And so you see and saw all of this rhetoric about the 613th commandment, uh, which is not to hand Hitler posthumous victories um, and so as I was growing up in the 1980s and in the 90s, this was the narrative that we were getting is that the Jewish intermarriage rate is very, very high, that this is very dangerous and that cultural Judaism is to blame. Um, and, and, you know, not handing Hitler posthumous victories is a lot to put on like a nine-year-old. So um, that wasn't great messaging. Um, and, and that was perhaps not the way to encourage a whole generation of young Jews to, to think of themselves in the world. Um, but nevertheless, this, this was sort of the, this was sort of the sense of things that, that was coming down that, that cultural Judaism was this dangerous force. And when I think about it, it's always been very hard to figure out what people mean when they talk about cultural Judaism. Um, this guy here talks about liking locks and bagels and having a vague duty to repair the world. A lot of it does become food. When you ask someone to define like, what's a cultural Jew? And like, oh, it's just, it's somebody who likes bagels um, or it's, you know, it's somebody who orders matzo ball soup at a diner. Um, and a lot of it became about engagement in popular culture. So I actually kind of think about this argument about cultural Judaism really lining up with the television show Seinfeld. So Seinfeld premiered in 1989 and went off the air in 1998. Um, and and in, to me, that show kind of encapsulated what people were so worried about with this cultural Judaism. It was this group of people who kind of seemed Jewish even though Jerry is the only character on the show who is actually Jewish, the others are, are sort of actively not, but, but they all sort of felt Jewish, but they never did anything Jewish and nobody ever went to synagogue and, and they didn't even have like, you know, on Friends, there was at least a menorah in Rachel and Monica's apartment around winter time, but, but Jerry didn't even seem to have a menorah. So like what, this, this made people uncomfortable. This, this sense of, Jews, but they're not really, but, but I can definitely tell that they're Jews, but I don't know why I can tell that they're Jews because they don't do anything Jewish. So, so to me, and in my research, this fear of cultural Jews, it, it really aligns with the way that Jews 
the changing way that Jews were being portrayed, especially in popular comedy media, um, because Seinfeld corresponded to a, a, a boom in Jewish sitcom characters. So it was not just Seinfeld. It was also Mad About You. It was also Anything But Love. It was also Friends. Um, there, there, was this, there was this big move in Jewish sitcom characters. And that, that concerned people. Um, so we can, we can stop looking at this angry man's op-ed for a while now. Um, so, so I've got, I've got that kind of going on in my brain and, and telling me that the research I was doing about Jewish comedy and about the way that some comedians, some Jewish comedians use Judaism in their comedy, that that wasn't just a story about comedy, it, it was actually getting at something much more important about the way that Jews for the last couple of decades, last couple of generations, have been thinking about themselves and their Jewish identity and what it means to them to be Jewish. So we've got that part. Then as I was writing the book, I, I came across, a, I hit a problem. Um, so I was talking about these, these four generations of people. And in, in the dissertation version, it was only three generations. The millennial, all the material on millennials was added for the book. So in, in the dissertation, it was just these, these three generations. And the oldest of those generations, I referred to as the second generation, because that's how histories of especially US American Judaism has referred to that cohort of people, that, that they are the, the second generation, meaning that they are the children of immigrants, but they are not themselves immigrants. So the waves of immigration in the United States and in Canada are slightly different, but they, they, they were similar, similar timing to them. Um, and so that big Eastern European wave that was coming over to North America between the late 1880s and the 1920s, um, that would have been the first generation and then their children would be the second generation. So I was, I was referring to that group of people as the second generation. And then the generation after them was the baby boom, which is what, you know, that, that made sense to me. And then the generation of after that was Generation X. And I was looking at that and realizing something was, was wrong. I, I was using, I was creating a false equivalency because the, the second generation and the baby boom don't line up to each other the way that I wanted them to. Um, and so it occurred to me that like, well, there is another name for that generation and um, we call it the silent generation. So the silent generation is marked by being the people who more or less were born in between the two world wars. So they're the children of the Great Depression. They are not Tom Brokaw's greatest generation who fought in two world wars. In fact, for the most part, they fought in zero world wars um, because they were mostly born after World War I, but all but the very oldest of them were too young to fight in World War II. Um, but they were aware of World War II. They were children during the war. It, the, the Depression and the Second World War really marked their, marked their identities and marked their consciousness. So I switched my language and, and I, I stopped referring to them as the second generation and I started referring to them as the silent generation. And I was thinking about it and thinking like, none of them would recognize this term. I, I mean, no members of the silent generation would tell you they were members of the silent generation. Nobody's ever heard this terminology before, you know? This is, this is the generation that those who are still with us are like Mel Brooks and Woody Allen, um, Philip Roth, who's now dead, and Bernard Malamud, who's dead, Joseph Heller. All of these, these are these are the silent generation folks. And you know, if you were to call up Mel Brooks and and ask him if you know what generation he's part of, I don't know what his answer will be, but I'm fairly certain it will not be. I am a member of the silent generation. That just isn't. It's not terminology that was used at the time. 
it was applied retroactively by sociologists. And all of these generations are, are made up in a sense, right? The, 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 um, the only one of these generations, yes, Mel Brooks would say he's from the degeneration. Um, good line. Um, the, the only one of these generations that kind of has an actual real end to it or start to it is the baby boom because there was an actual spike in the birth rate right after the end of World War II. Um, but sociologists say the baby boom generation stops in 1965 and the birth rate had actually been declining since the mid 1950s. So the boundaries of these generations are sort of always done retroactively. They're always a little bit made up. Um, but the, the silent generation feels especially made up because it, it really wasn't even a term that was being used at the time. So then when we look at the baby boom generation, you get a little bit of a hybrid there, which is going to, that's a theme that's going to carry through my remarks here this morning. Um, the, you know, members of the baby boom generation, for the most part, I think, see themselves as members of the baby boom generation. That may not be the way, the primary way they think of themselves, but if you say, you know, oh, are you a baby boomer? Um, yeah, most people who are a baby boomer know that about themselves and will say, yes, that is that is a term I recognize. That is a thing that applies to me. Um, but many of them also would think of themselves as third generation Americans. Um, so, it, you know, the, the second generation, that was a much clearer identity. By the time you get to third generation, not everybody's still thinking of themselves that way. But if your grandparents were immigrants to this country, especially if they were still speaking Yiddish or German, as you were growing up, you know, you may, you may well still think of yourself as a third generation, um, third generation person. Um, by the time you get to generation X though, that is effectively gone. Uh, you don't really run into members of generation X who think of themselves as fourth generation Americans or fourth generation Canadians. Um, they would more think of themselves as members of Generation X, especially in the United States. Um, and so Generation X goes from uh, roughly 1965 to 1980. Um, and it, it's the, the kind of turning point where you get a very strong sense that Jews, not that they've lost their Jewish identity, but that their generational sense of themselves has shifted to being part of a secular generational cohort and not marked by where they fall in relationship to immigration from the old country, wherever the old country was. And by the time you get to millennials, that I mean, insofar as it is true for Generation X, it is even more true for millennials. Most of the millennials I talked to while I was doing this project didn't even know off the top of their head how many generations ago their family had come to the United States. Um, a lot of them knew if they actually sat down and like counted backwards, um, but, um, but they, 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 didn't, they didn't think of themselves in that way for the most part. So, so I've, got, I've got these two pieces kind of rattling around in my brain. I, I have this sense of when and why and how we started to demonize cultural Judaism and I've got this picture of Jews as shifting their identities to being more and more aligned with their larger public secular cohort, generational cohort, and less tied to their identity as a grandchild of immigrants or the great grandchild or great great grandchild of immigrants. Um, and so all of that is then kind of coming together to push me to restructure the book and, and to create the book that I ended up creating, which to me is, I, I wanted it to be, and I think it is, it's a story about comedy and it's, it's a story about the way that Jewish comedians have related to Judaism in their comedy, but it's also a story about Americanization. And it's a story about, I, I, I reject the idea that it's a story about assimilation. I don't think that that's what it is. And I, I reject most of the cases that people say are 
examples of assimilation. I think that assimilation is is a term that gets weaponized often um, to to denigrate certain kinds of behaviors and identities. Um, so I, I try not to use it. So this is it's not a story about assimilation, but it is a story about Americanization to a sense, and it is a story about the way that Jews in the United States became more and more embedded within their broader cultural milieu. So, so that's the sort of superstructure that became the book. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about what I found um, and, and what was interesting when I started to actually look at the humor and break it down across these generations and notice the, the generational shifts and, and what was being handed down from generation to generation and what was being changed. So, so the first thing I discovered that surprised me should not have surprised me. I just wasn't thinking well. Um, but I, I, like many people, associate the counterculture revolution with the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, and therefore associate that with the baby boom. But as I mentioned, the baby boom cuts off in 1965. So the young people who were part of that counterculture were members of the baby boom, but they were being driven and influenced by popular culture and, and by comedy that was being produced by the people older than them. Um, so it was actually the silent generation writers and comedians that were, they were writing the comedy movies and the TV shows that were shaping the worldviews of the younger of the baby boomers in the 1960s and early 1970s. So what I hadn't expect, you know, because I, I thought like Philip Roth's first book, Goodbye Columbus, is a collection of shorter fiction. Um, Goodbye Columbus itself is a novella, and then there are a, a few short stories in that book. And that came out in 1959. And the image that we have of the 1950s and the early 1960s, um, especially in this country, is very, um, very con conformation, suburbia, TV shows like Leave It to Beaver and Ozzie and Harriet and these kind of cookie cutter suburban families who are all very white and very Protestant and the McCarthy hearings are going on and communists and Jews are being blacklisted out of entertainment. Like that's, that's the sort of popular sense of the 1950s. And, and so that is sort of where I had slotted people like Philip Roth because you know his first book comes out in 1959. But really, when I started to look at it, I should have been thinking of those people as the drivers of the counterculture. Um, so what I actually ended up finding in the silent generation comedies that I looked at um, is that they were very anti-authority. Um, they were they were anti they were very much opposed to institutional religion which is kind of what I expected. We think of Philip Roth as being somebody who got criticized a lot, especially in the first half of his career for being bad for the Jews um, and, and for, have, for, for airing dirty Jewish laundry. Famously, you know, Philip Roth got angry letters from, from rabbis telling him that he needed to stop what he was doing and that he was, he was fostering anti-Semitism. And we think of Woody Allen as being famously atheist and having no real um, having no real love for the concept of religion or God or organized religion, um, yeah, more Kyrie Schler as well. Um, actually, I have a I have a friend who does a lot of research on um, on that, and we've we've talked um, we've talked about those similarities. Um, so so. I found what I expected, which was the, we don't like organized religion part. What I wasn't expecting was the way that they were 
criticizing organized religion at the defense of the Jewish community. Um, that, that's what I found really surprising. So for example, I look at this Philip Roth story called Eli the Fanatic, which on the one hand is very much a critique of acculturated, comfortable suburban American Jews just after World War II, that they are trying to get, get along with their Protestant neighbors and they're trying to get along with their Protestant neighbors by making sure that they don't seem too Jewish. And you know they're all very concerned with fitting in. And it's that typical Philip Roth critique of comfortable, comfortable Jews. But in that story, the critique of comfortable American Jews is not just that there's something wrong with what they're doing. It's that there's something wrong with what they're doing because they're doing it at the expense of their traditional Orthodox Eastern European war refugee co-religionists. So in that story, there is a group of a group of orphan children from the war and these two men who are trying to open up a yeshiva for these orphans in this town. And the Jews of the town want to shut the yeshiva down because they think that that's too Jewish and that's going to scare their Protestant neighbors. Um, but the, the story ends up hinging on the fact that these comfortable Jews are, are so concerned with their own place in society and their own standing in this community that they're turning their back on these Orthodox European Jews. And those Orthodox European Jews are not the, the butt of the joke for Roth in this story. He, he is not making fun of their level of observance. He's not making fun of their religiosity. Um, he is not satirizing them. That is the theme that I did not expect to find. In these, um, in these silent generation comedies was this sense that, yes, we're criticizing institutions, but we're criticizing institutions because we're really actually quite protective of the Jewish people as a whole. And, and we are concerned about the, the health and the longevity of the Jewish community as a whole. Um, and so we see organized religion as something that is hurting the Jews but we see Jews as something that very much need to be protected and, um, and not, not rejected. So, so that was, that was interesting. If that had been kind of the only, if that had been the only thing, it wouldn't have really made a very good book. Um, if it had just then been a progression from there, but luckily for me, it wasn't. Um, so the baby boom, generation comes next and we'll we'll leave them aside for a moment because they don't what I found is that they actually don't have much of an identity of their own and, and baby boomers in the room I do not mean that in a pejorative way we will return to the, the baby boomers who are very good at business we'll, we'll just call it that for the moment um what was really fascinating to me is that when I started analyzing generation x humor if you think of this whole thing is a pendulum. It was on one side with the silent generation and it swung to the other side with generation X. So you would expect each subsequent generation to get less and less interested in organized religion, especially because generation X, these are the ones who are growing up 50% intermarriage rate, evil cultural Judaism, all of that stuff. So you would expect generation X comedians to be even less interested in organized religion than the baby boom had been, who would be even less interested than the silent generation had been. That isn't what I found. Um, what I found was a fascinating reincorporation of Jewish ritual into the writing and the movies and, and the comedy of Generation X comedians in ways that it was not, again, the in this case, the opposite of the silent generation, ritual Judaism, Jewish practice, Jewish observance is not the thing that's being made fun of. 
Jews themselves are being made fun of, but their engagement with Judaism is actually the thing that humanizes them. So a couple of examples that I look at, um, my favorite one is this novel called This Is Where I Leave You by a guy named Jonathan Tropper. They made it into a movie. The movie is very bad. I do not recommend the movie. Um, I actually mostly don't recommend the book either because it's, it's sort of hard to read. Um, because it is this book about people who are just awful. I mean, they're just terrible people. They're horrible to each other. They're incredibly dysfunctional family. The book, the, the sort of frame for the book is that um, the patriarch of this family has died and his last wish is for his children to come sit Shiva for him, which is surprising to everybody because this is not a man who had ever set foot in a synagogue in his life and nobody knew why he suddenly wanted his kids to sit Shiva for him, but you know, fine. Um, so they spend the week just being horrible to each other and ruining each other's lives and, and just being miserable, awful, terrible people. But there is this scene on the Friday night of the Shiva week where they go to synagogue to say Kaddish at the temple. And the narrator describes this numinous experience where he is standing on the bima looking out at the congregation the congregation is praying for and with him and his siblings and his his dysfunctional broken family and he talks about how revelatory that moment is for him and he says in the book that he wishes he could live in that moment forever and it, it's, it's not a joke. Like, like this is, the, this is the, the moment of seriousness and the moment of humanity that saves us from just absolutely hating these people for the entire 300 pages of the novel. Um, it's, it's this use of engagement in ritual that, that grounds them and that gives them dimension and makes them not just absolute walking stereotypes of dysfunctional, awful, neurotic, self-absorbed Jews. Um, there is, um, there's another movie, there's a, a movie from the same era called Kissing Jessica Stein, um, which is very similar. The characters are very stilted. They're, they're neurotic, they're um, self-absorbed, all of, all of those sort of tropes. But there are a couple of moments throughout the movie. There is a, a Shabbat dinner in the main character's homes there is a Jewish wedding, um, and and these are these are the times that ground the characters, and these are not the things that the writers are making fun of. They are not mocking the rituals. They're mocking the Jews who, in the rest of their life, outside of these times of ritual, are horrible, but in the moment that they're engaging with ritual Judaism, they find they find common ground with each other, they find humanity, they find depth, they find dimension. Um, and that is that is the complete opposite of how the silent generation had treated ritual. Um, ritual for people like Woody Allen was an empty, dead, desiccated, false kind of hope. Um, ritual for Gen X brings families together, heals, puts you in line with tradition. It, and it, it's not that Generation X suddenly like believes in God more than the previous generations did. It's that they believe more in the power of ritual and tradition and you do it because it binds you. you don't, you're not doing it necessarily because you have some sort of theological belief that is stronger than your parents or grandparents' generation they just have a different a different sense of what these rituals bring to a family or, or to a person. Um, so then if we go back to the baby boomers for a second, they exist in between the two and kind of do both. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s into the 1990s, the baby boom humor that I look like looks very much like um, like what the silent generation had looked at. Um, so for example, one of, the, one of the examples I have in the book, and this one, I'm afraid I can't stream for you because it, I couldn't get it to work over Zoom, um, but it's a Saturday Night Live commercial. 
from the 1970s. Um, is one of the fake, uh, if you've ever watched the TV show Saturday Night Live, they do these fake commercials um, for fake products. And so this is a this is a fake commercial for a car called the Royal Deluxe 2. And they are proving what a smooth ride this car has by having it driven over this bumpy pothole filled road while a rabbi in the backseat performs a circumcision. Um, so like this deeply important traditional Jewish ritual is reduced to a thing that gets used to sell cars um, and to show what a, what a smooth ride. Um, so, you know, baby boom, early baby boom comedy is, is doing the same thing that the silent generation comedy had been doing. The, the ritual is really not very, um, ritual's not very, uh, very useful. It, it, it's empty, it's hollow, you know, whatever. Um, by the time we get to the late 20th century and the, into the 21st century, the Jewish comedians who, the baby boom comedians who have had longevity and, and are still going, um, they actually start to shift so that their comedy begins to look more like what Generation X was doing. Um, and, and a great example of that is uh, the Coen brothers, the filmmakers. Um, their early films, their early films are not all that Jewish to begin with, but they, their early films are all marked with a, a sort of anti-religion bent in general. Any religious characters in early Coen brothers films are either like bad guys or ridiculous. Um, whereas if you look at their film, uh, their more recent film, The Serious Man, this is a movie where everything is going wrong for the main character. He has a terrible life. Um, his wife has left him for another man who then dies and she asks her ex to pay for the funeral of the new guy because nobody else is around to do it. He's gonna lose his job, just everything is going wrong for him. Um, but towards the end of the film, his son has his bar mitzvah and um, as he and his wife are sitting there watching their child go through his bar mitzvah, it is kind of the only moment of hope we get in the film is, is this, um, this they're, they're beaming as they look at their son and there's this shot of them holding hands. Um, so there's this the sense that maybe they're going to resolve their differences or at the very least, at least they are coming back together to be able to co-parent their children. It, it's kind of the only hopeful moment in the movie. And again, it comes through ritual. Um, so I wanna show you a couple of clips to illustrate this um, because a picture is worth a thousand words and I don't know, but a video must be worth more than that. Um, so let me pull up a share screen optimized for video. Um, so first of all, this is a clip from the um, Woody Allen film, Hannah and Her Sisters. Um, and uh, Woody Allen's character is contemplating converting to Catholicism. Um, oh, why is my screen sharing paused? Hang on, Zoom share. Nope, okay, stop that. And try it again. Um, so as I said, it's it's getting tougher and tougher to share videos over Zoom. Um, okay, I think no, it paused again. All right, this will either work or it won't when I play it. Um, the uh, but what's going on is that Woody Allen's character is contemplating converting to Catholicism, and so what we see is this uh, this short scene. It's only about a minute long, where there's no dialogue um, and you you get his very very pithiest approach to what religion is um and the answer is that religion is essentially stuff so i'm gonna hit play i am not able to see you all right now to get your reactions to whether this is actually playing or not so if marilyn or somebody on the team can unmute if this isn't working um let me know not working okay i then don't know why um other than the fact that video is hard um so 
Let me try one other thing. Let me go into my advanced options. And this. Okay. Do that. Do that. No, it keeps it keeps stopping every time. Okay. Well, fine. I will unfortunately have to describe the video to you. I'm so sorry. Um, this this is an ongoing problem with trying to use video over Zoom. Is it? It does not want to work. Um, so, in this scene, um, as I say, he is he's contemplating converting to Catholicism. So you see him go to a church, and he's talking with a priest, and the priest is just handing him book after book. He's got this like big stack of books, and he walks out, and then you see him go to the shop and like look in the shop window. And then you have this shot of him coming home. And the shot of him coming home is only like his torso and the table. So you can't see his head or his face. And he puts book down on the table, um, which seems to be like a, a gold leafed um, Catholic Bible. And then he pulls a crucifix out of this brown paper bag and puts it down. And he pulls out um, this icon um, of a Catholic saint and puts it down. And then he fumbles around in the paper bag and he puts down a loaf of Wonder Bread and a jar of Hellman's mayonnaise. Um, and, and that's it. And then the camera cuts away. So like this is this is Woody Allen's approach to organized religion in a nutshell, um, is that religion is just about having the right stuff and it has no like no meaning to it that effectively, you know, you can just become Catholic by suddenly switching from rye and mustard to white bread and mayonnaise um and that, that that's all that's all it's going to take to be to be a boy um you know that that's pretty emblematic of the way that um that silent generation comedians treated um ritual judaism and, and religious judaism um so then i would have showed you the scene from well let's see maybe maybe it's just that scene that's working why not try the exact same thing and expect a different result? Let's see if this clip will work. Uh, I got muted. All right, sorry, let me try that again. Okie dokie. Zoom share. Nope, it's still not going to do it. So, all right. Um, so then in Serious Man, which again is a baby boomer comedians, um, as I mentioned, the the it's it's during this bar mitzvah that we see um, that we see hope and that we see some love and connection and healing happening for this family. It's it's the it's the bar mitzvah that that brings them together in that way. Um, the final clip I would have shown but I'm not even going to try because I think at this point we've proven it's not working, um, is a one of the musical numbers from Crazy Ex-Girlfriends. So that that's the final piece of this puzzle are millennials. Um, and millennials, the story of millennial Jewish humor is still being written. The oldest millennials are only about 42 years old right now. So they are just becoming the kind of dominant forces in comedy um, and in entertainment. So it's it's gonna be another few decades before we can really have the distance to look at millennial humor and, and kind of say what was going on with it. But so far, it seems as though they are willing to ridicule both Jewish identity and Jewish religious interaction at various times, depending on what suits the comedy, because they are part of what I like to refer to as Generation Adam Sandler's Hanukkah song, um, which just raised a raised a generation of Jewish kids to feel differently about being Jewish, that it was something that was fun and cool and all of these other, you know, people are Jewish and, and it's just it's just kind of a hip part of the zeitgeist. So they neither have a sense of oppression about their Judaism, but nor do they have a sense of embarrassment about their Judaism. Um, so they are willing to ridicule Jewish practices and Jewish uh, institutions sometimes because it's not, it's not mean-spirited in the same way that it may have been in earlier generations. It's just, they're making fun of the things that are part of their lives 
and these Jewish institutions and Jewish practices are part of their lives. So the clip I would have shown was from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Um, and if you have not watched that show, it is, it's very, very funny. And this is a musical number called Remember That We Suffered. Um, so the main character has flown from California home to New York to go to a cousin's bar mitzvah. And her mother, who is played by Tova Feldshu, and the rabbi of the synagogue, who's played by Patti Lupone, sing this song called Remember That We Suffered, which is just basically about the fact that Jews can't do anything without talking about the Holocaust and being sad about that. That like even the happiest of events, they have to sit around and be like, but also the Holocaust. Um, so that's that's where I see millennial humor going. Um, because at the same time, that is sh that's a show that also very much embraced the Jewishness of the main character. So yeah, she's making fun of Jewish obsession with the Holocaust in this one song, but she's also absolutely embracing Jewish identity in another song. So for, for millennial Jews, this is what I see, this is what I see happening, that their Jewishness is much more comfortably integrated into their identity. Um, and they, they neither feel like they need to make excuses for it or um, hide it or focus on it. It's just one, it's just one more thing about them that will sometimes be part of the comedy and sometimes not. Um, so I, I do apologize about the clips. Um, I, I wish that they had run, um, but you'll have to take my word for it. Um, but now I would like to open up for conversation, right? Is that where we are, Marilyn? Excellent. Well, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I see in the uh, chat a few people um, uh, 